hear another airstrike. My name is Bilal Abdul Karim, and uh, I'm a journalist originally from New York. Um, and uh, I spent about six months plus in a Hayat Tahrir Sham uh, prison in Syria. I was arrested by Hayat Tahrir Sham in August of uh, 2020. Um, it came approximately two hours after I did a report that was highlighting um, the uh, serious and numerous allegations of torture in the prisons uh, under Hayat Tahrir Sham's uh, control. And I asked a very public question, what is Hayat Tahrir Sham's public position regarding torture? Um, after I did the, uh, the report, uh, I left my office, went to the gym, did a quick workout. And when I was on my way home, I stopped at a masjid and <laughs> there were several cars with the uh, masked up people, and uh, I was arrested. I was under arrest. Um, after I was arrested, um, I was taken to uh, a cell, and then I was taken for interrogation. I was blindfolded and handcuffed. I was asked, do you know um, who is holding you prisoner? And I said, yes. And they said, you're being held in the prison of Hayat Tahrir Shem, um, which puts the lie to the lips of the leader of Hayat Tahrir Shem, Abu Muhammad Jolani, who maintains that Hayat Tahrir Sham has no prisons and that these are the prisons of the Salvation Government. <laughs> Nobody here uh, gives any great credence to the Salvation Government. I doubt that there's one in a hundred people who could even tell you who the president of the Salvation Government is because everyone knows that he wields no power. And that's the reality of the situation. Um, after I was arrested, and then they said, uh, they said, okay, uh, this is interrogation. We need to ask you some questions. Um, if your answers are not forthcoming, then we do have the authority uh, to uh, physically uh, do things to you so that you will tell us what we need to know. They lined me up against the wall and as if they were about to start beating on me. And I just said, okay, well, we'll go ahead. Go ahead and do it. And uh, they ultimately didn't do it. But um, I was then sent back to my cell. And basically, I stayed in my cell um, in different prisons for the next four and a half months. And um, I had no lawyer. I had no access uh, to anybody on the outside. Um, I was just gone. That was my situation. I myself personally was not subjected to any type of physical torture. Um, I was in solitary confinement for more than six months. Um, however, every, almost every day of every week, I had to listen to the screams of torture going on in um, other areas that are just uh, a few meters away from me. So um, everyone in the prisons can always hear the torture. That's why um, when the uh, HTS leader, Abu Muhammad Jolani, stated that there's no torture in the prisons, everybody here found that to be comedic. He's just not being genuine with the people, period. That's the reality of the situation. As I was told when I was arrested, when I said that I want to have a lawyer and I want to see a judge, they said, this is the security division. There is no lawyer and there is no judge. Well, I, I was maybe assuming that that was part of a scare tactic, but it wasn't. The joke was on me. Um, there was, uh, I had no access to a lawyer of any kind. And the actual uh, judicial process, if you want to call it that, was as follows. After I was in prison for four and a half months, the guards came to my cell, knocked on the door, said, uh, come with us. They put um, a blindfold on me and shackles on my hands. Then they put me in a van and they took me to another location. We moved the shackles, we moved the blindfold and said, your trial is about to start. So I said, uh, well, you know what? I've been in prison for four and a half months and um, I have no access to a lawyer. I have no access to call any witnesses. Um, uh, I have no access to the internet so I can see the context of whatever statements that you're going to charge me with. Um, I, 
you know, 10 years of bloodletting and fighting, this is the type of justice that we can expect uh, from your rule. And basically it was like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay, uh, duly noted, let's continue. So I knew at that point that it was all fake. At this point, I'm in prison now for six months. And they said, okay, next week we'll, we'll, we'll come back and we'll give you your verdict and or release or sentence. I went back to myself and I knew that there had to be some face saving going on here. When I was called back into the room a week later, they said, charge number one, incitement against the authorities, guilty. Charge number two, defamation, guilty. Charge number three, meeting with slash um, uh, a knowing location of wanted persons, guilty. And I'll just explain this part. You see, they gave me nothing in writing. So my charge of meeting with slash knowing the location of people, it changed during the actual trial. But I had no defense against it because they never gave me my charges in writing. And the fourth charge was, no, was having relations with groups that are threatening security. Once again, guilty. Three months for each charge, I do a year in prison. I said, I burst out laughing. I thought it was the funniest thing. They didn't like that so much. They said, why are you laughing? I said, I'm laughing because I used to do stand-up comedy, but I can't write jokes like you guys. I said, there is no justice in this. There is no Islamic justice, no secular justice. There's no justice in this at all. This is purely political because I exposed your torture ring. And that's why I'm here. Even the days when I was in prison, I had no regrets. And um, it was told to me after I had been pronounced uh, to have to spend a year in prison, and this was at the six month mark, I was told by the warden of the prison that if I did a plea for clemency, they would release me early. And I said, do I have to apologize for, work, for, for what I did? They said, yes, but it's just a small thing. I said, go back and tell them I will not apologize. I said, do you know who Nelson Mandela was? He said, yes. And I said, do you imagine that he was going to apologize for wanting, uh, for, for fighting for civil rights? I said, do you know who Malcolm X was? He said, yes. I said, do you imagine that he would have apologized for fighting for, for, for the, the due and just rights that his people, our people deserved? And I said, go back and tell them I absolutely positively will never apologize and I'll stay here for the other six months. So um, I'm saying that to say, that, look, what this whole thing was all about was all about justice. That's what the whole thing was about from the start. And having a press that is going to be willing to put their necks on the line to be able to, to expose wrongdoing when it's, uh, when it's there and to put certain things out there for public scrutiny, that's a, that's a part of any healing process that's a legitimate process, anybody that wants to stifle that, then I question whether they are actually going to be the legitimate rulers. Well, my past relationship with them was good. What does that mean? Well, that means that uh, I, I would go to Battlefront with uh, some of their fighters. Um, I would do interviews with some of their uh, um, with, with some of their members, but then once um, I started to uh, do interviews with the mother of one individual who was killed under torture in uh, uh, Heights Tahrir Sham's prison, his name is Marwan Unki. I did an interview with his mother. The, their politics towards me changed, um, and. Uh, some of their members said to me, Bilal, we thought you were cool. And I said, well, you know what? If covering up your torture um, means that I'm cool, then you know what? Go back and tell them that I'm not cool and I'm not gonna be cool because that's not what I came here for. So um, in the past, our relationship was, uh, was good and it was very amicable, but it changed around 2018 when um, I was obligated to do reports about torture and some of the wrongdoing that they were doing. Now, what took place before 2018 um, and, and what was the change that happened? Well, 
The change is simple. They came to power. The point of the matter here is, is that um, I cover that which is apparent. If people are, are fighting on the front lines and they're being heroic in that, that's what I saw, that's what I covered. Once these people come to power, and then they start doing things other than that which they said. They promised to bring Islamic rule. They didn't do it. They promised to bring justice. They didn't do it. I was obligated to report those shortcomings. And that's when they turned hostile to me. Well, regarding the statements that uh, Abu Muhammad Jolani made in, 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 uh, in regards to Tawqir Sharif and uh, his statements of uh, torture in uh, HTS prisons, um, if I can pretty much sum it up in two words, I could say that Abu Muhammad Jolani lied. And, you know, um, as I said, I've spoken to Haya, to Tahrir Shem members about this issue. And uh, I even spoke to one member who basically got up there and said, no, he did tell the truth. So I looked at him like this. I said, what? He told the truth. There's no torture in the prisons. And he said, and I quote, Bilal, torture is not how you understand torture in the West. He said that it's allowed to show them something of punishment to get them to admit to their wrongdoing. And, uh, and I'm taking what I just said very, very seriously. This is exactly what was said to me in my living room by one Ahayat Tahrir official. And um, I said to him, I said, well, issue number one, um, you're starting to sound like the Americans. We're not calling it torture. We're calling it enhanced interrogation uh, 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 tactics or techniques. Um, torture by any other name is still torture, which is the first thing. The second thing is um, beating people, hanging them, which are some of the, the tactics that they use, hanging them for long periods of, of time, whippings on the soles of their feet and the backs of their legs. These are the things that your leader, Abu Muhammad Jolani, condemned the Essid regime for doing. How is it that he's now doing the exact same thing that he condemned the regime from doing? So just to sum up the whole thing, Abu Muhammad Jolani, point blank, he lied. Do I believe that Abu Muhammad Jolani is a terrorist? I don't believe he's a terrorist. I think that I have serious issues with Abu Muhammad Jolani, but to say that he and Hayat Tahrir Sham is a terror organization, no, I don't see that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I support what they are doing um, since they've come to power, but to say that I think that they should be on a terrorist designated list, no, I wanna be fair and I don't see that. Well, if they are pulling off attacks um, um, against innocent people, London, Madrid, France, and such like that, then sure, I'm gonna be right alongside with you. But there is no record of them doing that. I don't think he's a terrorist. I think that he's unfit to rule um, if he's gonna continue on the path that he's continuing on now. But one thing that was clear to me was that he's looking for legitimacy from the West. Uh, if he wants Western legitimacy and he wants to go after that, that's fine, that's his business. But if he thinks that I'm going to stay silent while he tortures and indefinitely detains his way to power, well, as we say in America, I didn't come to Vegas to lose. I have moved uh, um, away from uh, ter uh, territories under the control of HTS. Um, uh, I did not feel comfortable in those areas. I was told by their official that Bilal, um, we consider you to be a threat to security in these territories. In another meeting which I had um, with them several weeks ago, they told me that they considered me to be more of a threat in these territories than an ISIS suicide bomber. These are statements which came from them. They. And, they, and the reason he said that was because people listen to you. Well, I said to them, show me where in my reports I lied, exaggerated. If you can't show me that, then who's the oppressor? So I was forced to leave their territories. 
Um, I, I didn't want to. I mean, I'm 50 years old. You know, you kind of get stuck in your ways. Um, you know, I, I, I know where everything was at in my house, but I couldn't stay there. What am I going to do? I could either just be quiet, stay silent, and just open up a, 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 a hot dog in a, in, in a pizza a pizzeria, or I could say I'm going to change my location and I'm going to continue to report. I'm going to continue to uh, uh, give a voice to the voiceless, and they just have to do what they have to do. I think that the Syrian people are special people. I, I just think that. They may, they may not be, but I think that they're a special people. And I think that they have the ability to do some special things. So I do believe that they're going to say, we are not going to go back uh, to those days of torture and definite detention and fear. And I do think that they are going to move forward. Um, I think that a lot of other different groups have tried their best to subjugate them again, and they failed. And I think that if this is Abu Muhammad Jolani's uh, attempt to do the same thing, I think he's going to fail also. And I think the Syrian people have a, a tremendous resiliency, ingenuity, and I think that they're going to come out on top. It's going to cost, but I think they'll come out on top in the end. I'm not sitting here at all uh, crying any crocodile tears about, oh, ho, 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 look what they've done to me. Um, no, I have. I came here not because I didn't even know who Abu Muhammad Jolani was. I'd never heard of Jebel Tunusra before in my life when I came to Syria. So I had no connection to them. And my remaining in these territories has no connection to them. Um, I'm doing what I'm doing because it's the right thing to do. Now, I have to be willing to pay the price um, for that conviction. And I believe, and Allah knows best, I am willing to pay that price. <laughs> that price is high some days. It's not fun. But I think it's the right thing to do to give a voice to the voiceless so that the people can decide who they want to support and why based upon statements and, and, and actions and not just what other people said. So my fight continues. And as long as I'm effective, then I'll continue to be here. When I'm not effective anymore, I'll pick up my marbles and go.